Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see that curry is a wonderful motivator. <laughs> Lovely to see you all here. This is the uh, first uh, talk of the uh, new semester for the Rhodes Centre. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Michael Zakim of Tel Aviv University here to talk about his new project, Accounting for Capitalism, the World the Clerk Made. I'm just going to say a couple of words not about this because Seth is going to do the introduction for Michael proper, but just about some of the things that we have coming up over the semester, um, just to get us started. First of all, this Friday, we are hosting, uh, along with uh, the Brown Institute for Environment and Society, a conference, uh, America's Climate Change Future, Housing Markets, Stranded Assets and Entrenched Interests. Sheldon Whitehouse, our senator, is going to be there along with a bunch of other people. So if you're interested in how climate change may actually affect things much closer to home than you think, for example, Rhode Island real estate could be a good thing to come along and have a look for. After this, we've got a couple of talks coming up. We have Linda Hui, who uh, was one time the BBC's um, I can, no, uh, BBC's China correspondent, who has uh, a great book out called What Would the Great Economist Do? She's coming in to talk to us uh, February 25th. Then we have Ling Chen from Johns Hopkins Science. She's got this masterful book on how China manipulated globalization. And then April 8th, Sophia Barta, In the Red, The Politics of Public Debt Accumulation in Developed Countries. So we're hitting all the high points, basically too much debt how globalization gets manipulated, and what would dead people tell us to do. I think that's a, a nice suite of things, you know, to get us started in this semester. And without further ado, I shall ask Seth to come up and introduce Michael. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you all here today. Thank you for coming out. Uh, it's a rare pleasure to get to introduce uh, someone who has played such an important role in uh, a scholar's intellectual development as Michael Zakim has played in mine. Uh, when I think of who are the interlocutors in the field of the history of capitalism or of 19th century American history, uh, Michael really stands at the top of the list. So being able to uh, see him here today at Brown, to introduce him to you, and to have him share his work with you is uh, an extreme pleasure for me. So Michael, who teaches at the University of Tel Aviv, uh, is currently really the leading cultural historian of the American economic past, a position that was attained through his wonderful 2003 book, Ready Made Democracy, his 2011 field-shaping book, Capitalism Takes Command, uh, and the long-anticipated book that he'll be talking about today, Accounting for Capitalism. Uh, Zakim is a graduate of Oberlin College and completed his doctoral work at Columbia University in the 1990s at a moment when a critical mass of scholars, some of whom may be known to you, Jeff Sklansky, Sven Beckert, others working in the orbit of uh, Betsy Blackmar and Eric Foner, were really forging a new scholarly field, uh, the history of capitalism, although maybe doing so without really articulating it or even knowing it uh, at that time. So in order to understand sort of where Zakim's work fits in and, and, and where this field uh, sort of occupies terrain in the broader sort of scope of historiography, it's probably important to take a step back and talk about what this new history of capitalism is, because by talking about that, you will have, in fact, a better sense uh, of why Michael's work is so important. So basically, over the last decade, historians have made a concerted effort to reclaim the economic past from the rigid and ahistorical methodologies of neoclassical economics. So instead of studying economic transformation from the perspective of institutions and policy, historians of capitalism is, have interwoven several uh, related but discrete subfields, business history, labor history, economic history, history of technology, political economy, and the history of economic thought into a new field of study that is fundamentally geared towards the project of denaturalizing capitalism. That is, considering capitalism's governing institutions, its practices, its ideology, not as the inevitable process, uh, product of human progress or of inexorable market forces, but rather as the result of complex cultural and political work necessary to make a historically specific form of market organization appear to be, in fact, timeless and incontrovertible. In some ways, the history of capitalism as an intellectual project might be thought of as something comparable to science studies or to STS, an enterprise that similarly seeks to denaturalize processes that appear to be inevitable under the heading of progress. Both undertakings interrogate their very subjects, science, capitalism, as contested terrain where claims to authority and social power are made and exercised. Presuming nothing to be inevitable, historians of capitalism and STS scholars embed what they study in a matrix of social relations, cultural practices, and institutional arrangements operating under specific yet always contingent 
historical circumstances. Put differently, the histor history of capitalism ultimately seeks to dismantle or open the black box that obscures the substantial work involved in transforming aspects of the material world into interchangeable and exchangeable units. The most important work in the field has come from the methodology, I would argue, of cultural history, where scholars have interrogated the economic itself, trying to ask how this particular realm of human experience came to be understood as standing apart or outside other facets of lived experience and the social and the cultural. And to that extent, when we have a cultural historian who can talk about the history of capitalism uh, in the way that Michael Zakim does, we are in for a real treat. In some ways, Zakim framed the governing or organizing question of this field in the introduction to the 2011 volume that he edited with Gary Kornblith called Capitalism Takes Command, asking the question of how capital became an ism, right? How did basically the notion that there is property that can be invested become an organizing ideology that structured not just market relations, but every facet of the human experience? This is the kind of generative question that has already launched dozens of dissertations and that I could think will continue to organize much of the field ahead. Michael's own work as to how capital became an ism uh, has been pursued by looking at particularly squirrely characters in the economy. And by squirrely, I, I, I don't mean um, um, individuals so much, but rather types of people whose work ultimately is crucial to the material development of capitalism, but upon whom all sorts of, of fantasies, anxieties, and aspirations can be read upon. So in his 2003 book, uh, Ready Made Democracy, uh, it was in fact the seamstress who was the key figure, right? The clothing industry's analog to the machine, uh, someone who lowers the production of, of uh, of, 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 of making clothing at a moment when clothing was becoming mass produced, uh, but who also as a figure raises all these questions about gender, about democracy, about race, uh, and about whether or not capitalism and ultimately democracy could be reconcilable uh, at a moment when both were rushing headlong uh, under this flag of this new American nation. Um, the seamstress at the heart of this ready-made democracy book uh, is someone who is not simply the victim of capitalism, not a, 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 a merely suffering and exploited worker, uh, but really a, sort of a central figure on whom or through whom you can see all of these processes at work. So in some ways, it's not surprising that Michael has found another, perhaps even more urgent figure to read the history of capitalism through, and that is the clerk the subject of accounting for capitalism, the book you'll be talking about today. I won't spend any time talking about uh, what's in the book, because I know Michael will do so, but simply to say he's previewed this book with a number of, of articles that have been in a, in a range of, of, of publications um, that have basically given historians a huge amount to think with, not just about the accounting practices of the new businesses of the 19th century, but really getting into the nitty gritty of the posture of the clerk at the desk, the ink uh, which he used, the social lives of, of, of these people, and the ways in which their ambiguous status uh, as knowledge workers, but also interchangeable and easily replaceable workers, raised a huge series of questions about whether or not capitalism would in fact be a set of practices that would fulfill the aspirations of white manhood uh, in the new nation. So without further ado, I want to welcome Michael Zakim and please join me uh, in, in welcoming him to Brown. sit down. That's uh, protocol allows that. Slightly less formal setting. Perhaps part of a, uh, an attempt to turn our... Can you... So, oh, okay. All right. So can you hear me? Just fine. Okay. Um, before I would... Before I begin today, I'd like to say a few words. But my brother-in-law, Yoron Ezrahi, who passed away yesterday. Yoron was a professor of government for many years at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was a scholar of modern science and of modern politics, and most especially of the relationship between the two fields. I'll sorely miss him. <laughs> 
that the world of scholarship will miss him. A world of Israeli politics will miss him, perhaps most of all. In any event, I'd like to dedicate my remarks today to his memory. I want to begin with my own account, my own accounting for capitalism. This recently published, oh so cleverly titled study, which is about, it's actually about a lot of things. But I think most generally, it's about modern capitalism's stunning success at capturing not just the material, but also the moral high ground, empowering America's great transformation into a market society. I often conceive of these events exactly how Seth described uh, 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 them, that is, in literal terms. Thinking about capital's emergence as an ism, as a capitalism, it's one point in the middle of the 19th century. Such etymological detail was revealing, I think, of an extraordinary event, and that is the conversion of a highly specific form of wealth, which up till that time had also been a, traditionally at least, a highly marginal form of wealth, into an encompassing worldview, an ism, at once a commercial logic and a social ethic of purported relevance to the whole of the human condition. Another pithy way of summarizing these revolutionary events is to speak in terms of the commodity's rise to sovereign status. Again, not just within the economy, but in the polity. Any such account, by the way, is necessarily a history of the winners, a kind of history which has been neglected in recent decades, if not simply dismissed as illicit hagiography of dead white men. But in fact, I think the opposite is the case. I think that the scholarly devotion to the social margins, to the victims of power rather than the wielders, those who wield power, has often served to privilege the latter, has turned their power into something of a self-evident postulate against which the struggles for justice are waged. Too many cultural, social, and labor histories have consequently rehearsed the market's own foundational conceit, namely, that it has no history. And that due to the market economy's natural genealogy, I adopt, however, the opposite approach working under the assumption that the commodities emergence at the nexus of social life required a sustained material as well as philosophical effort. Or, again channeling Karl Polanyi's rage, disguised as irony, and I quote from his great transformation, to make Adam Smith's simple and natural liberty compatible with the needs of human society was a most complicated affair. To presume otherwise is to embrace the market's own declarations about the transcendent status of truck and barter. The power and privilege of dead white capitalists had to be earned, in other words, for there was nothing natural or preordained about the stunning ascendance of this radically new form of social material life. And so the United States boasts a rich, revolutionary tradition, namely capitalism, whose development closely follows upon a Schumpeterian narrative of creative destruction, destruction of not only an ancien regime of agrarian households, but of previous incarnations of itself. The abolition of slavery remains, I think, the most dramatic episode in capitalism's permanent revolution although there are moments where it seems that its current subversion of liberal tradition might prove to be equally cataclysmic. I recently read Wolfgang Strieck's How Capitalism Will End, so I've come to you in a particularly pessimistic mood tonight. So now I'd like to move beyond such manifestos and offer some slightly more focused remarks regarding my accounting for capitalism clever title. Did I mention that 
did any, did anyone catch the the implicit reference in the subtitle, the world the clerk made? Who am I paraphrasing? Genovese. Genovese, the world the slaves made, which I consider to be arguably the most important work of American history written in the 20th century, which of recent years has been largely airbrushed out of the historiographical memory of our profession for reasons perhaps we don't quite have, we might want to, Seth might want to expand upon later in our discussion. In any event, my accounting was inspired not just by Eugene Genovese, but by the insights of a few others as well. The first is a passage from Karl Marx's essay on capital and wage labor, which was published in 1849 as something of an outline draft of what would become Capital about 15 years later. At one point during a discussion of the unfixed nature of prices, Marx explains that in the total movement of this disorder is its very order. This struck me as a most perspicacious observation, not only of the eternal logic of exchange, not only even of the industrial economy in toto, but of all of modern life, of a modernity in which change became the only permanent feature of the system. Georg Simmel would eventually offer his own version of this dynamic in the philosophy of money, identifying that historical pivot when stability and absoluteness, his terms, gave way to motions and relations. How, I wondered, since I'm an historian and no philosopher by any means, was such disorder practically rendered into a working system, leveraged into a high-functioning liberal order? This question led me to statistics. In industrial technology for the production of knowledge. Actually, I think the statistics are more ambitious than that even, designed as they are to produce absolute truth in a post-absolutist age driven by a market that turns everything into a relative value. Most importantly, statistics generated certainty or objectivity without abandoning that relativism. Impermanence, the untethered movement of persons and goods, constitutes the very ontology of statistical knowledge. This is where my argument begins. And in narrative terms, this is where the book actually ends specifically with the manufacturing schedule of the federal census of 1850, one of the watershed events in the history of American governmentality. My engagement with statistics then soon extended to other techniques, similarly devoted to ordering the perpetuum mobile of capitalist life. This included first and foremost, accounting. A centuries old invention in contrast to the statistics that now came into its own as both praxis and parable, turning the trivial into the metaphysical in terms borrowed from Marx's famous discussion of fetish in the opening chapter of Capital. That is rendering the total movement of disorder into absolute truth, or in the terms of accounting, of course, into the bottom line. So another question that informed the beginning of this project was how the bottom line became a synonym for the truth. But because I wanted to write a social history of capital, to chronicle this capitalist revolution on its own quotidian and even banal terms, to unpack its epistemological apparatus, I found myself invariably drawn to the clerk, the business clerk, of course that pallidly neat, pitiably respectable, incurably forlorn figure who now emerged at the center of the industrial landscape. Employed in counting rooms, credit agencies, commission businesses, trust companies, law offices, insurance brokerages, auction firms, import houses, savings bank, retail stores, and wholesale warehouses, devoting long hours to taking stock, keeping accounts, displaying wares, delivering bills, distributing samples, 
paying import duties, figuring interest charges, and copying, copying out a constant stream of correspondence. This new class was assigned the most important production project in the new economy. Production, that is, of the market itself. As such, and perhaps anti-intuitively, the clerks comprised a revolutionary class. Contemporaries certainly understood as much, for they promoted these dandies of the desk, that's not my term, into an object of anxious conversation about the end of the real in favor of the nominal, in using Emerson's terms, which anticipated Zimmel's transition from absoluteness to motions and relations. But more than Emerson, it was Herman Melville who consistently and obsessively addressed the crisis born of a post-absolutist world without God. In everything he wrote, at least after 1850, it was Herman Melville who recognized the clerk's central place in this age of anxiety. Why, I asked myself at the beginning of this project, did Melville locate his archetype of modern schizophrenia in a commercial law office on Wall Street, busily copying out deeds and contracts? And so I begin the book, not exactly with Bartleby, but with all his paperwork. A day and night line, copying by sunlight and by candlelight, silently, palely, mechanically. The resulting piles of documents, warehouse receipts, and tariff digests, and solvency proceedings, and three facsimiles of all correspondence in the event that one copy was lost in the mails, while the third was kept on file to ensure that both parties were working off the same text is not to be dismissed as the detritus of modernity, nor even as ephemera, since everything was systematically filed for future reference anyway, and certainly not as metaphor. This was, rather, the very, all this paperwork, the very infrastructure of capitalism, and a sign that the Republic's founding relationship between labor and its fruits was coming undone. Trade, I mean to say, would be the basis of industry rather than the opposite, exemplified by remarkably white hands, as Asa Green observed in The Perils of Pearl Street in 1834, while the de ladies declared the clerk, declared about the clerk that he smelled delightfully. He really did emerge now as something of a Daumier caricature. The clerk was consequently denounced by almost everyone for producing nothing of value, apropos of versions or emerging versions of American manhood in the middle of the 19th century. In fact, I argue that he produced the very system of value, doing so in counting houses that function as assembly lines for the mass production of indices, rates, schedules, consignments, contracts, reports, surveys, updates, and the increasingly ubiquitous profit and loss sheet namely a knowledge economy. That paper economy rested on writing techniques designed to speed up production by adopting a looped style once considered effeminate, but now embraced for obviating the, obviating the need for ever removing pen from paper in the course of the writing, while at once saving on the number of strokes required for fabricating each letter. The letter the alphabet was broken down into an interchangeable assemblage of basic arm movements, divorced from the meaning of the words themselves, anticipating the machine logic of the typewriter. Clerks did not as such become appendages of the machine, but they turned their own appendages into something like machines for producing a capitalism ever more dependent on written information. This office regime spurred a flurry of technological spillovers, single standing desks and double counter desks featuring either nine or 15 pigeonholes. In fact, if, if you recall, I think one of the strangest passages in Melville's story, Bartleby, is when they reach into Bartleby's pigeonhole, deep, deep into the pigeonhole and pull, I can't remember what exactly, they pull out like an old bologna sandwich or something. It's after they've carted him off to the tombs. <laughs> 
A new steel nibs that replaced the traditional quill were now invented, found their most perfect realization in the through-flow me mechanics of the fountain pen, newly patented, along with aniline inks that would not corrode the metal, the paper itself, different versions of paper uh, from the continent that, that proved more appropriate for, for a, a bookkeeping, other paper for correspondence, et cetera, et cetera. All this scrivening was devoted to the accounts, of course, which I argue did not just serve the increasingly complex needs of doing business, but the needs of society at large by transcribing the commotions of the market into a remarkably consistent geometry of perpendiculars, rows and columns that integrated all the buying and selling into a unified field theory in which everything became accountable or knowable by assigning it a price. The industrial market, which was no longer confined to any particular time or place, that is to any market place, found its most tangible existence here in the standardized fields of the ledger. This was where all parties met, and this was where flesh and blood values became abstract equivalencies that made the accumulation of capital, that is profit and loss, synonymous with the economy. What I mean to say by all this is that the signal contribution of the accounts to capitalism, a notion familiar to us, in fact, something of a cliche even from Zombart, for instance, or Max Weber, they, there's the contribution of the accounts issued less from their success in measuring material reality than in creating that reality and that by counting and calculating an ever-expanding universe of goods, the accounts proved just how naturally commodifiable everything was. Well, that's the first chapter. <laughs> I'm already out of breath, and I promised to be as short as I could, as concise as I could. It's actually a pretty short book, but it's a bit on the dense side. It's a problem with my writing style in general. I don't want to say my thinking style. So I'll make, I'll, I'll make my best effort to abbreviate what follows. But I'll take you through the chapter so you get a general sense of the various perspectives that inform the world or that explain the world the clerk made. The following chapter explores the social, not just the epistemological effects of all this paperwork, chronicling the rise of a market society upon the ruins of the patriarchal household that had once and for a long time grounded America's great experiment in Republican politics. Patriarchy gave way to a fraternity that was populated by individuals serving as their own best agents, searching always, falling, picking himself up again, often disappointed, never discouraged as Alexis de Tocqueville described the phenomenon in, in the second volume of Democracy in America. This was an identifiable homo economicus who understood life, his life, as an enter or everyone's life for that matter, as an enterprise whose opportunities were to be maximized and who spoke literally in terms of time profitably spent, of an investment in personal character, and certainly gave an accounting for himself. These weren't just rhetorical gestures, though. They were a literal expression of reduction of meaning. Social life became embedded in the economy, plotted within a benthamite grid of costs and benefits that found pointed expression in a remarkable neologism of these years, a standard of living, which could never have been calculated let alone conceived in an agrarian economy. We can certainly now begin to talk about the social life of money. While the abstract quality of such a mass circulating currency dissolved the intimate fabric of the patriarchal household, money also then connected all the atomizing interests back together and did so significantly enough without relying on the organic hierarchies and the absolute values that had once secured the social order. These developments reach a narrative climax 
in Chapter 2, in a thick description of salary negotiations, a commercialized version of the social contract, I argue, a fraternity of strangers that required one and all to act with a common purpose, a shared dedication to each one's own best interest. Otherwise, the salary negotiation, of course, was something Bartleby never, never learned to do, which explains, of course, our own incomprehensibility regarding his personality. Not only ours, his employer's incomprehensibility. Anyway, I, I then expand this discussion of uh, a fraternité, this market personality in the following chapter, which engages the other definitive ism of the times, and that is individualism. By reconstituting public life on private prerogative, individualism no less radically upended the traditional order of things than did capitalism. But into the individual's emergence or transformation into, a, into an ism, into a new cultural hero, was a distinctly post-patriarchal event, which, whose hero, of course, was no less than the self-made man, another expression born of the times. Self-made men were truly, truly subversive, replacing not just the patriarch, but God himself as their own maker. And thus, they need to be understood in literal terms, namely as a production project, and in this case, production of the exemplified in a novel, another novel literary genre called autobiography. Indeed, the self-made man is the other great production project of the industrial century alongside the market and concurrent to the market. Interestingly, however, and perhaps surprisingly to us today, the self-made man also initially appeared on the historical stage as a counterweight to capital's subversive effects on social life. If growing and making things no longer proved to be virtuous, a virtuous or even a reliable foundation for order in the new economy, as contemporaries worthily ask themselves, what would fill that essential role? What was the proper object of man's prodigious powers of production and his command, his growing command over nature? Well, man himself would become that object safely ensconced outside the nominalism of commercial exchange. I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well, as Thoreau announced in explaining the prevailing use he made in Walden of the first person singular, as he announces early in the book in a chapter The first person singular was an organic whole identi identical with itself and so immune to the divisions of labor, the transmutations of form, and the constantly renegotiated value that were coming to define all other forms of property. The self-made man thus redefined liberalism. Lockean self-possession from a century and a half earlier was divorced from its dominion over the external things of the world by which it had anchored a labor theory of value. It was reconceived as the dominion over oneself, no longer the outcome from mixing one's physical labor with nature, but from applying mental labor to the production of one's own life. This delivered a sober rebuke to those traditionalists who continued to celebrate the virtues of productive labor, the productive laborers, virtues of productive laborers as well. It was no coincidence that William Ellery Channing's self-culture, which I think is the definitive text of what Tocqueville a year later described as a new social philosophy, that is individualism, was originally composed as a lecture, a sermon might be a better association. What I mean to say by all of this is that the new form of productive labor, production of one's self, ideologically disenfranchised the working class while bolstering the rule of the unproductive, desk-bound bourgeoisie. 
but it did so not by celebrating the market order, but by condemning it, by recognizing, in fact, the economy's unhappy effect on men's souls. Um, the chapter then plays out by exploring another important site of paperwork, the personal diary, which I suggest that the diarist acted as something of his own clerk, carrying on a debt relationship with himself, rehearsing the same logic as the new imperative of accumulation played out in the account books. So the diary reveals ultimately just how relevant paperwork was to making persons as much as it was to making profits, which is also why these two great production projects of the age, production of the self, production of the market, were so closely intertwined, and also explains why despite the self-made man's initial efforts, he ultimately became synonymous with homo. So from here, I move on to complications, to the same, exploring these same complications, the same recognition of the deleterious effect of the market on our souls, by a, with a chapter a, devoted to the subject of desk diseases, a diagnostic rubric that I borrow from the contemporary medical discourse about a series of nervous disorders that principally affected those who were furthest removed from hard work out of doors. I open with an examination of some of the infirmed themselves, William Hoffman, who succumbed to dyspepsia in its worst forms soon after finding work at a Manhattan cloth importer. Edward Taylor, who became increasingly preoccupied with a sharp pain he traced to an optic nerve being strained and tasked too much by the miserable blinding light which finds its way into our counting room. Robert Graham, who complained of enfeebling headaches that came on after long days spent copying out the correspondence, comparable to the torturing headache and wretched nausea Alan Richmond attributed, attributed to the same labor-intensive office regime. Meanwhile, Charles French's eyes swelled up so much the store's back journals in Boston that I was unable to leave the house for a week, and I was obliged to wear a covering over them and keep them constantly closed. Look at our young men of fortune, Harper's Weekly soon concluded, about such lives embedded in the market. Were there ever such a pasty-faced narrow-chested, spindle-shanked, and dwarfed race. So debilitated, degenerate bodies were not, I want to say, the exclusive possession of the age's subaltern classes, a means of marking and consequently excluding black or female or proletarian others from public life. Alongside this well-studied medicalization of deviance, the opposite dynamic proved to be no less prevalent and I would argue more important, namely the medicalization of normality. The truth is public life in antebellum America was inundated with melodramatic infirmity on the part of those model citizens of the commercial republic all of those self, those same self-making men. At the same time, their ailments became the setting for an equally adamant performance of recovery by the same sedentary types, who accordingly overcame the very threat the capitalist disorder posed to themselves and to society at large. So in an inversion of terms suited to these revolutionary times, one had to be sick in order to become well. It follows then that the bourgeoisie, all those dead white men, did not renounce their bodies. They most insistently lived in them and through them and proved to be far less immaculate and far more hysterical than we have heretofore recognized. Among the thick mythology of headaches and dizziness, deteriorating eyesight, liver dysfunctions, deafness, piles, failing bladders, not to mention the omnipresent problem of masturbation, I devote most of my attention here to an epidemic of constipation, commonly diagnosed as, as dyspepsia, 
that broke out sometime after 1830 and prompted a wide, broad range of reme remedial responses, largely and significant, significantly familiar to us today in the 21st century, vegetarianism. Organic food, of course, but first and foremost, graham bread. Also the avoidance of fatty and fried food, unripened fruit, strongly flavored dishes that dangerously encouraged one's appetite, full and deliberate mastication, the single dish method, or the one meal per day system of eating. This control over the appetites now emerged as the principal site, or one of the principal sites, of responsible self-government. And this is the place to at least parenthetically take note that Bartleby ends up starving himself to death. But it was probably Ralph Waldo Emerson who promoted this gastrointestinal gestalt to its neurotic consummation when he began to log the net weight of his daily intake at meals happily reporting after the first week of a per diem reduction from 14 and a quarter to 12 and a half ounces. So this new, distinctly private version of self-government probably found, I argue, at the gym. This was where the pasty-faced, narrow-chested, dwarfed race of clerks practiced a new form of individual sovereignty now called physical education, a catechism designed to arrest the corporeal decline that was so imminent to commercial civilization. And in fact, arrest it in terms of man's own or a, a due to man's own immense capacity for self-restoration, self-government. Consequently, overturning all those old, tired, agrarian cliches regarding the corruptions of modernity. And really, my clerks were busy stopping at the gym on their way down to the office in Wall Street for an early morning workout. The final chapter of the, in 1840, that is, not 1990 or 2019, the final chapter of this accounting of capitalism is devoted to the invention of statistics excuse me, of statistics, of which I've already spoken. This was a distinctly, these statistics were a distinctly modern form of knowledge based on ability that prevailed so much in a society where ever-increasing numbers of persons found themselves living outside of familiar networks of households and villages. The statistics thus became a central means for reconstituting social order on the unfixed terms of market society. The statistics were used to count both the population and industrial production. And the fact that the same scheme was applied to goods as well as persons promoted it into another means by which society was embedded in the economy and vice versa. That is another epistemological way station in the history of what we so casually refer to today as human capital. My focus is on the federal census, and specifically the census of 1850, the first that was to survey individuals rather than households, posing all the interrogatories to all persons who were identified by name for the first time and accorded their own distinct field in the blanks. The results were unprecedented, a nearly limitless avalanche of data, or a ledger of the nation as the superintendent of the census, someone by the name of Dubot, happily declared. To make a rather intricate story much, much shorter, the same post-patriarchal taxonomy that individualized in order to universalize proved equally effective in counting industrial revolution. I'll spare you the details, as I promised, but the unpres unprecedented unprecedentedly inclusive, diverse returns regarding the nation's economy were achieved by making capital output the guiding principle of the data collection. This, in fact, the statistics, one could thus say, turned money into the foundation of objectivity. 
Not only did the manufacturer's schedule's blanks resemble the ledger's symmetries, but the commodity form itself was a sign epistemological status, resulting in an economy that worked only for profit. This meant that the mixing of labor with nature would not be counted as an industrial activity in the formal or the official version of the nation's economy unless the resulting, res resulting products of that labor circulated as goods for sale. All this means that truck and barter came to underwrite both common wealth and common sense, that being the world the clerk made. So accounting for capitalism finishes up with a short disconsolate essay entitled White Collar. And it seeks to bring the clerk problem up to date, up to the operative logic of today's neoliberalism. I then segue into a short, angry riff about the paperless office, initially theorized in the Reagan years, which seems a perfect, seems perfect shorthand for the gig economy's flex time, at once metaphor administering the dematerializing essence of a post-industrializing economy. And yet, I would suggest, I do suggest in the book's conclusion, that today's capitalism remains saturated in paper, even if this is no longer the stuff of rags or any other form of physical pulp. But the fact is libraries and documents and folders and files and perhaps most insultingly bookmarks fill the same function they did in the early years of the regime. The abstraction of knowledge into forms best suited for business, whose origin is not found in, in a computerized technologic, but in a commodity logic that then informed the computer. The fact of, and I remind you of something that should be as obvious to us as anything else, and that is machines didn't make capitalism. Capitalism made machines, apropos of the Industrial Revolution, which is another rubric that we've lost. That's, that's fled the historiographical conversation, most unfortunately. Pen and paper, in other words, and here I'll conclude, had always rendered virtual reality endowing an otherwise unilinear world with a widening array of temporalities and valences, that, which that being the basic condition for capital's continual migrations from place to place and from form to form, passing between merchant, industrial, and financial incarnations, and then back again, and then back again, enough to make anyone not a little dyspeptic. Thank you. Are you happy to field questions? I'm very happy to do questions. so much for your talk. Um, it was really, really fascinating. Um, you mentioned Thoreau and Emerson throughout your talk, and so I'd be very curious to know a little bit more about how you read them uh, within this overall project of self-making, uh, because I think of them as people who recognize this all-encompassing market culture that was prompting people to remake make themselves, um, but who at least attempted to, form, to craft forms of life that were at a remove from it and to retreat from it, but do you see them as perhaps nevertheless being co-opted by it, or um, I, don't know, I, would, I would just love to hear more about your thoughts. Anyone else want to pipe in in regards to thorough? You know, I spent a sabbatical in Boston a few years ago, and they kept telling me, it's thorough, not thorough. <laughs> so I'm the only person in Tel Aviv who says thorough, pronounces his name. <laughs> Um, yes, they were. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a debate about Emerson. I think Jeff Sklansky in his wonderful book about the market economy's effect on men's souls seeks to as alienated from the market logics uh, uh, that it for, he might first, it seems, and he was 
very central to the product to the individual's transformation into an ism, which of course I argue in this book and elsewhere is a essential pivot or essential uh, element in the life of the market. It, Thoreau was much more explicit in, the, in, in condemning the effect of the commodity on, on, um, on our lives. And he was quite insightful, in fact, in recognizing how much of what appeared to be at first traditional forms of manly labor engagement in the soil had also been co-opted, to borrow your term, had also been commodified. Even the, the, the same farmer who owns his own soil, so in the same famous chapter, famous, f famous passage in that famous chapter, an economy with which he opens Walden, he says, I look around me and I see them plowing their fields and growing wheat. Or, he says, they're not growing wheat, or, or they're growing dollars, and that's... Uh, and that's ruining their life. And then he, and then he plays off, he, he, it, it's hard, to, I think it's hard to, but there's a, there's a delicious sarcasm in the book, including his sarcastic use of accounts, right? He, he adds up the value of everything he ate, and at one point he says, yes, I had, I had eaten $8.34, so it's a, so there's a terrific ambivalence, uh, uh, if not uh, outright uh, um, opposition to what's going on. And it doesn't, I don't like to say the market co-opted them, but capitalism was able to incorporate even the criticism. So um, Channing, who's close to Emerson and Thoreau, and was an important host for Tocqueville when he arrives in Boston in 1831. So Channing devotes his self-culture to, a, 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 to deep reservations about this developing market culture. But he does that by, in fact, also devaluing traditional Republican notions of productive labor, which ultimately serves an ideology, the capitalist ideology, without so, so this is some of the more structural uh, movement going on underneath the service, which I think informs what I described in the beginning of my remarks as a rather breathtaking political and moral success of the market in redefining who we are, or in, in inventing or turning us into capital, human capital. Hang on a sec, we've got a microphone because we actually post all this stuff. Thank you. Uh, clerks and, and uh, bureaucracy are often given as, a, as a, an important ingredient uh, of civilizations that have been, uh, been, been called great. Uh, the Egyptian, uh, Roman, uh, uh, Venetian, uh, even the strength of the papal uh, powers. Uh, how do, how do uh, the, the clerks that you describe in capitalism uh, differ, or do they differ, between uh, the important contribution that uh, uh, clerks and record keeping are important to the commerce of, of any civilization? Okay. Right. A th ten thousand dollar question. What? <laughs> what? What have you said that we didn't know before? Um, yes. It, you know, it's interesting. Whenever I talk about this subject in, in Israel, where, in Eurocentric history departments and Israeli universities, I have, to, I have to devote several long minutes to explaining that the clerk I'm talking about was employed by businesses and not by the state. And we're used to thinking, when we think about the history of bureaucracy and when we read Weber, we're first and foremost thinking about the state's use of clerks, of paperwork, of the kinds of even managerial techniques for organizing, surveying, uh, um, and uh, ordering modern life. So uh, first and foremost, in terms of the history of bureaucracy, what is it's relatively novel in the industrial century is how much this has become a commercial or a private and not a state-driven business or employment. Now, on the other hand, as you rightly point out, 
they didn't invent commerce in the 19th century, but here I revert to kind of my earlier generalization about, or um, observation that the capital was an old category, but what was new was how central it had become to economic life in, in modernizing and kind of industrializing or Christian world of Europe and, and um, North America. And in that respect, the fact that the clerks had become a mass, had become a class which, if we look at the employment statistics by 1855, when they start asking enough specific questions that we have something called employment statistics, we recognize the clerks to be the third largest group working for a wage in Manhattan and most every other city after day laborers and some other. So they become, in fact, the single largest wage earning profession in the industrializing economy by the mid-century. So it's a mass phenomenon, just like capitals become a mass phenomenon. And my young men are moving off the farm, moving off the family farm, and in that respect embodying what the great defining movement of the birth of capitalism, and that is the economy's shift of its, of, of its gravitational center from land into labor. So all these are rather new developments. And, uh, and, uh, and, and ultimately, then I would also suggest paperwork's very logic, the very epistemologies of accumulation and profit and loss in their insinuation in the way we understand and construct our own lives. Completely novel. And that's a very clerical, it turns out to be a very clerical, you're all clerks. We're all clerks. Makes, deepens my sadness. I do own a pair of Clarks. I'm not sure that I'm a clerk. Maybe not. First of all, thank you for the talk. I needed that. It actually made me want to buy the book, in all seriousness. It really did. I thought, that I've, was great. In which case, I have to apologize for its cover price. I, I, I don't care. I'll use funds, someone else's funds. <laughs> oh, that's I'll use my clerking function to basically expropriate funds in order to make this happen. So you, you started, and we had a slight conversation about Pollyanni, and you mentioned Pollyanni. So here's my one line on what you said. Clerks produce nothing of value except the infrastructure of value based upon legibility. So that's my little, that's what I think you said, right? And I agree. Now, here's the question then, who produced the clerk? Because if it's the self-made man, the self-made man is coterminous with the clerk, they're kind of co-products. So my Pollyannian hat says, where is the state in all of this? Because Pollyanni, as I read Pollyanni's claim is, the market order is violence, the market order is usurpation, but prior to class conflict, it is a state conflict whereby you get the state in order to make markets. So I'm just wondering how that fits with this, because it, there's a danger or perhaps a sense in which it becomes co-production rather than an essential beginning of production. Uh, thank you for gastrointestinal gestalt. That is the best phrase I've heard in ages, and I will be using it everywhere. Um, second comment, Schumpeter was also mentioned. And when I was listening to you, I was thinking about if you take your description of the self-made man and place that against Schumpeter's description of the entrepreneur. At the end of Capitalism, Social, and Democracy, he goes through this long lament about the decline of the self-made man, or as he puts it, the entrepreneur, precisely because, in a sense, clerkism has gotten out of hand. So rather than it being a kind of technology of the self that balances the dyspepsia produced by being the clerk, in this case it goes terminal. And I'm just wondering if you think Schumpeter would be able to read you and understand where you're going with it. Two big questions. The first one's very big. Seth, why don't you tackle the first one? <laughs> the state and the economy, the state and the market, Europe or Britain and America, you want to? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll start with Schumpeter, which is a, which, uh, is a little more direct. The decline uh, of the entrepreneur, right, the, um, the decline of the entrepreneurial spirit of the free market. And that becomes, that, that thing gets played out in a post-war, in a, in a, in a, a 
T. Wright Mills's white collar, or William White's corporate man, I, even, even, even Burnham. Burnham a, I even wanted to pull out, a, I even wanted to pull out Death of a Salesman. And this lament, Fordism, squashing of the human spirit, and almost and a nostalgia. By, by the way, I have a very short, but I thought, I think, unusually good a treatment of the role of nostalgia in also, as also actually a product of market economy or of capitalist, of a capitalist civilization, and how nostalgia also allow, helps us turn disorder into order without, without reverting to a pre-modern organic hierarchy. So this kind of post-war nostalgia it, it, it became it, it very, very common. Uh, and then it gets overturned. Then, of course, it gets overturned by the 80s with the rediscovery or reinvention of the market, or the Reaganite invention of the market. Um, what was the question? So that's Schumpeter. So my, so yes, so my my young men belong to the golden age of my, and they certainly. There's no doubt the move off the land, into a labor market that allows them to sell themselves, to market themselves, to maximize themselves, to essentially produce themselves and not wait around for 20 years for their father to die so that they can inherit either the farm or enough cash to buy a farm out in Minnesota is experienced as a truly freeing moment. I'm very skeptical about what comes out 100 years later, and that is the yearning for the freedoms that we've lost. I think my skepticism is informed by the last 30 years of our worshiping at the altar of, mark, of, a, of the free market and seeing just how non-liberating it is. And that's as far as Schumpeter is concerned. The state, of course, Polanyi is in Britain. And the, um, the fight, you know, this Ricardian fight to, uh, uh, over the poor laws it ultimately depends on, um, on state legislation. So in his argument, of course, is there's no such thing as laissez-faire. The British state, the English state, without the English state, there would never be a market economy. And we know this also from legal historians in the United States. My favorite, um, my favorite is, and I'm not even going to be able to pull his name out, um, no, no, <laughs> um, um, an older Wisconsin school, Hearst, Willard Hearst, who has wonderful uh, scholarship devoted to how much laissez-faire was dependent upon all sorts of, not just le less legislation, but more court-driven uh, law uh, in which, um, which redefined property rights. Uh, without, of course, for a moment overturning the very category of private property, but inverting it entirely. And I guess the, the most, the, 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 pivotal, the pivotal moment is the Charles River Bridge decision by Judge Taney in 1837, if I'm not mistaken. It, but he, so you've opened up a huge, interesting can of worms, a comparative can of worms as well, and that is the state. So in here, and, and I find myself working through the census, working the invention of statistics, even though it was managed by these new statistical associations, largely based in Boston, but there was a group, an important group in New York as well. Nevertheless, they understood they couldn't do it without the state. Only the state had the bureaucratic apparatus to carry out a nationwide survey, asking 20 million people the same question. So there, these are, Getting back to what you already suggested, these aren't dichotomous terms by any means. However, they're place, no doubt. And in this respect, I will revert to some degree of American exceptionalism, and and think and argue that and argue that the that um, that my clerks, my clerks, not by accident, my clerk is working in a law office on Wall Street and not in the Treasury Department in Washington. 
Yeah, this is kind of a follow-up, I guess. Uh, Mark asks, who produces the clerks? It seems to me there are at least two aspects of that. There's the material aspect, who produces people who are actually doing these jobs, and then there's the constructionist aspect of this, who defines them as clerks. It seems to me that it's not a coincidence that when you talk about your two largest categories of labor in the census in New York, they're day laborers and they're clerks, and they're both incredibly large heterogeneous categories that if they were defined in different ways would have been smaller and more numerous. At the same time, in terms of the material question, where do these guys and women, well, guys, actually come from? You seem to conflate uh, industrialism and capitalism, but they're not necessarily the same thing. When you talk about thorough, you talk about agrarian capitalism. We also have examples of industrial societies that aren't capitalist, like the Soviet Union. So I'm wondering whether you see these people as derived from capitalism, from industry, or from the combination of the two. I think it's very difficult in the United States in the 19th century to distinguish between industrialization and capitalization. Industry is increasingly capitalized, intensively so, and requires more and more capital investment, even, 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 in, 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 even, in, even in branches that are not uh, machine-driven. I, I you know, revert back to, to my ready-made to my, my, my invention of the ready-made Sioux, where you could start up a business with not a huge investment, but the industry itself was, was uh, a, a registered arguably the greatest capital investment in the entire economy by 1860. It, um, it, so there's no, obviously, we're, this isn't a Soviet model, but no one, but in the collectivization or state-owned this, you know, the bridges in Charles River were never state-owned, even the first one that was built under agrarian auspices. Uh, so that was never an option. So here, I, I don't distinguish. You're right. I rather do conflate. And thus, I, I, um, I, I, would like to, uh, I would like to bring back industrial revolution uh, as a concept and not just a a uh, turn of phrase to our conversation. I think it's very, very relevant to the changing experience of work and labor and the relationship of work and labor to economic structures, first and foremost, the market. So um, it, you also asked a lot of big questions. You're also right about who's a clerk. Most of my clerks are writing out copying correspondence and, and and doing double entry bookkeeping because they've all gone to business school. Not really, they took business classes. There's a huge now industry of training these clerks. So in a way that becomes maybe one way of identifying them or defining them. Someone who's acquired a new toolkit, a post-agrarian toolkit. And there's and this whole rather fam largely familiar a, a advice literature on how to become an independent young man a, in a cosmopolitan, so when you're alone in the city, largely, uh, uh, largely tells them, go learn, go learn to do the books and improve your handwriting skills. By improving, they mean not just legibility, but speed. So there's a speed up. Long before Ford, there's an intense speed up of the production of these documents. Um, many of them would prefer to be salesmen. They prefer to sell rather than, than manage the accounts because they get a commission. And if they can be sales and they apparently improve their, improve their, um, a, the odds of becoming, uh, being invited into the firm as a partner because they're able to generate income. Much of a distinction because I see them moving back and forth and I, and I, and I identify their activities as devoted more or less to the same object, which is buying and selling things. But yeah, you could, if I was more, so I didn't really write about clerks. <laughs> I used them. I didn't write a social history of clerks. I wrote a social history of capital. If I was to, if I was, if I was a better social historian, then I would pursue your set of questions. But I'm not. So fascinating stuff. We we've had Polanyi, we've had Schumpeter, so I'm going to do Bourdieu. And, oh, okay. and so what I'm what I'm 
curious about is, you know, you use the phrase truck and barter quite a bit, which I assume you're kind of taking from the primary sources partly. It's not just your choice, but it's The it's primary the, source. So, Mike, to me at least, the, the phrase truck and barter is actually not from the world the clerk made, right? It's from the world that the trader or the merchant or the sea captain made. Truck is transportation, barter, right? A connotation of haggling and so on, right? And, and so what the clerk is doing actually isn't truck and barter. It's much more about a commodity form where you can transfer things on paper and they become transferred. You don't have to put them onto a ship or onto a truck, right? Um, and you don't have to barter them because they have a price attached to them, which can be recorded and so on. And so the Borgiavian question is, if at the time people talked about this as a world of truck and barter, it, it seems to me it's kind of misrecognition. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the sort of the social cultural history of the, the misrecognition and what, you know, what the effect of that was in the development of, of the world that the clerk made but claimed the sea captain made. Right? Okay, I think you explained it. The big difference is we can call commodification or dematerialization. Most of, so there's this wonderful passage where I think I took from Hunt's Merchants Magazine. Right? It was a fairly central monthly being read by a lot of people around the country, uh, where they said, you know, don't we live in a remarkably progressive, enlightened world where a single clerk now is alone working in a giant warehouse on the wharves no longer needing to move the goods back and forth from place to place, but only refile this receipt and transfer it to that file, or at the most mail it, which is now, which is now, the mails having now been significant, the cost of mails having now been significantly reduced, and I think we know from David Henkin that 90% of the private mail, the newly reduced, newly cheapened private mails in the United States uh, in the 1850s are business mail. So, so there's, they're, they're already aware of the dematerializing nature of commodity exchange. Is this Smith? Did Smith know that this is 50, that 60, 70 years later, uh, this would be, become the basis of the wealth of nations? Um, I, don't, I don't know, I, maybe. Maybe. I, I have a lot of things to say about Smith. I'm not going to say them. Um, he's also one of my heroes, as he was uh, uh, for Karl Marx. Uh, but what is clear is that this economy of exchange, you know, markets have always existed, or I'll always say, I'm an historian, I'm not allowed to say always. But we've had thousands of years of markets and, and perhaps even a longer history of exchange, but something's different now. And I think one of the most spectacular uh, um, expressions of this difference is the anonymity of exchange. You're doing business with people you don't know, you never will know, you've never met. And in that res and, and this is a grid that covers now almost the entire economy. This isn't that, that oh so thin layer of globalists working the Atlantic economy in the 17th and 18th century. It's everyone, all citizens, buyers, sellers, brokers. And that's, that anonymity, I think, is what means that truck and bar, nothing's going to move without the paper. And that's new. That's new. I, that's my argument. That's industrial, and that's industrialization, I would also suggest. We'll make this our last question. Oh, okay. okay. I, uh, I, I thought you might say that uh, capitalists created clerks because two, two comments. I, I once read a book, Professor Blythe will like this, I once read a book that posited that the big eight accounting firms were founded by English investors sending Scottish accountants to look over their, their investments in uh, western rangeland. And, uh, and they, big eight accounting firms came from, from them when they, when they needed other things to do here. And the second thing is when you read about the uh, creation of the uh, commodities business in uh, a book I read by William Cronin about uh, Chicago, Metropolis, uh, one of the keys was the, the, the system that the various uh, segments of the markets came up with that made it possible for the farmer to uh, 
trade to someone he didn't know by classification of grain, by identification of letters of credit and other financial instruments and things like that. I, I think you could say that a lot of uh, the, the capitalists themselves created clerk through the systems that they felt that were necessary for, for, for just improving their business. Is that fair? I, I, I'll sign on. Right. He's a structural. He, he, the, the economy needed him, so it invented him. And they jumped at the, these young men jumped at the opportunity. They still do. Right? They're still busy interviewing at law st in Wall Street firms, law firms. What's changed? In the end, uh, in the end, at the end of my uh, book, I suggest, as I, I did here today, that, I, I, that because capitalism is a permanent revolution, there, it's, it, it's constantly upending itself, but there, but there are uh, common denominators that prove to be remarkably uh, Persistent. Um, one tiny thing in Dakota, just to sum up, just to sum up the big thing. That's his logical conclusion, and then no, don't need this. Here's his logical conclusion: the uh, not rather than accountancy firms, just consultancy firms that become the zenith, because their job is to tell you, no matter how complex things get, no matter how frightening it is, we can tell you what box to put it in. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Just a thought. Yes. All right. This Thank you all for coming today. Thank you very uh, much. Let's thank Michael Sakim for his.